Agriculture or farming, not as we think of it today, started with the Native Americans in Wisconsin. Since the 1830s, Wisconsin uh, farming and that was the major industry in the state. It still is. Uh, the agricultural products that Wisconsin produces uh, is accountable for most of the income in the state today. It's billions of dollars. Well, Wisconsin will never be known as the Corn Belt. It will never be known as the Wheat Belt. Uh, at one time, we were called the Dairy State. Uh, that title has gone to California now. But Wisconsin still is the biggest producer of cheese in this country. And that's because of uh, what Wisconsin is. It has the, the climate, it has the soil uh, that is really conducive to dairy farming. The weather is probably one of the biggest controlling factors that farmers have to face. Uh, it's either too dry or it's too wet. It's too cold or it's too hot. Uh, it's things that farmers have basically no control over uh, with the weather. And uh, they're at the mercy of the weather. They've been facing uh, climate changes and that for a long time. Now I think uh, we all need to be aware of it, whether we think it is uh, global warming uh, or if it's in uh, long-term climate change. I don't think that we can put our finger on one or the other and say, yes, this is the cause for uh, the changes in the weather. I, I, I personally feel that it's a combined effect of both of these. And uh, I think society needs to be willing to accept some of the alternatives that uh, we are coming up with. In fact, this was identified, I think, 100, more than 100 years ago, that if the amount of carbon dioxide increased in the atmosphere, the climate of the world would increase. We've known about it for 150 years. I mean, the first measurements on CO2 absorbing were done in about 1860. In 1895, a Nobel Prize winning chemist warned us that by the end of the 21st century, the average temperature was going to go up 8 to 10 degrees and the climate, the, the Earth would change. It's not new. Climate change is a very controversial topic now, as I'm sure you know. And the concern is, is it caused by man? And two, is it indeed occurring? But I'm not an expert in this area. I have to rely upon others who are experts. And I've read and listened to a number of people who are climatologists who have a background in this area. And they've caused me to question about whether or not it's valid, the assumption that indeed climate is changing significantly caused by humans, as others do. Well, I'm a scientist whose professional focus has been on global warming, that is, human-caused climate change, for 20 years. I keep on top of all the research. I think it is clear not only that global warming is occurring, but that's being caused by human activities, primarily the combustion of fossil fuels. The lifestyle that we live here in the United States, we have about 5% of the world's population and we use about 25% of the world's resources. And that means that we produce about 25%, way out of proportion, the amount of carbon dioxide that we produce per capita. It's based on measurements. And measurements are not opinions. They're not really disputable. They can be reproduced at any time. What are those measurements? Number one, carbon dioxide absorbs infrared back radiation from the Earth. We know that. Anyone can measure this in a scientific laboratory and verify it. Number two, the combustion of fossil fuels, that is coal, oil, and natural gas, produces carbon dioxide as a product. And that combustion has been occurring at an accelerating rate ever since the Industrial Revolution began about 200 years ago. So we know that. That's not disputable. Number three, the rate at which carbon dioxide is increasing and the amount that it's increased, we know that as well. What is the current amount in the atmosphere? It's 35% more than 200 years ago. Now think about that, 35% more of this heat absorbing gas than 200 years ago. Well, there's some evidence it's man-made, but then again, there's some evidence that it's at least uh, much of it is not man-made because again, we go through climate variations throughout history.
but I would be the first person to remind everybody that we do have natural fluctuations which are added on top of the climate trends. A lot of the people who are not scientists will sometimes say, well, it's just going to be an oscillation and there is no climate trend. Um, uh, tend to be people who are very focused on just the oscillating behavior of weather. You have cold air masses, you have warm air masses, and, and things like that, the day-to-day -day stuff. As soon as you start to talk about the climate in a particular region, like North America or state of Wisconsin, then you see much more internal variability that different states are experiencing different kinds of weather, so they experience different kinds of change. There is that variability, that, and people remember the variability, and they don't necessarily remember the trends. You know who remembers the trends? The older generation, who remembers what their childhood were like when the climate was one way, and then 50 years later, the climate is, is on average a different way. I'm not that old. I've only been around for four decades. And I think that's the danger when people are asked that question. How do any of us pay attention to what's really going on in our in our weather or, in our, or outside. We have these visions of what weather used to be like when we were little, but our time here is short. I don't like to get involved with a debate about uh, it's all this climate trend or all that natural fluctuations. I think some of the very important work of the future will be based upon the fact that there is going to be both a trend and natural fluctuations. And it's when you add the two together that you start to have impacts of climate change. Taking carbon out of the ground that's been stored there for millions of years by natural processes and all at once burning it and putting into the atmosphere has upset the balance of the natural greenhouse gases in the air and is causing the planet to heat up. Anybody who has ever taken a basic climatology or meteorology course knows that the greenhouse gases uh, are what keeps our temperature as warm as it is on Earth. If we did not have greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and other gases, um, in fact, we would be much colder than we are. For example, water is a greenhouse gas. Uh, ozone is a greenhouse gas. Uh, carbon monoxide is a greenhouse gas. Uh, uh, methane is a major greenhouse gas. And as a result, we need, I think, to look at more of these problems instead of just CO2. Water vapor is actually, or what we normally call humidity, is actually the most important greenhouse gas. Well, what, where does water vapor in the air come from? It comes from evaporation from the ocean. So as the atmosphere gradually warms due to increasing carbon dioxide and its absorption of infrared radiation, the, it exchanges heat with the ocean surface and the ocean surface gradually warms. And as the earth, ocean, ocean surface warms, uh, everyone who's ever boiled an egg knows that warmer water evaporates more. And that puts more water vapor in the atmosphere, which in turn accelerates the global warming. But that doesn't mean that Wisconsin will have the very same temperature change. Uh, it may be hotter or it may be cooler or the answer really might even depend upon the season of the year. Uh, winter in particular may be the harbinger of things to come. Uh, cold weather is starting up later and winters are ending earlier than, than they used to. Um, for instance, 150 years ago, the length of the ice season was about 125 days where the ice prohibited boat traffic on the lake. Now, the average length of the ice season is about 80 days. And this year, uh, the ferry boat started running on March 11th, which is very early, a lot earlier than normal. So the length of the ice season was only about, was it 38 days this year, as opposed to you know, the recent average of about 80 days and what used to be 125. People will say, well, but it didn't, we didn't have any really hot temperatures last year. One of the features which is a little more subtle of global warming is that it's the minimum temperatures that are rising the minimum nighttime temperatures. Now what's the evidence for that? The ice. I like to say if I look out my kitchen window and I see the icicles melting, I know it's getting warmer outside. That's a kind of thermometer. 
the Earth's thermometer is the ice on the Earth. Scientists call that the cryosphere. It's primarily in Antarctica, Greenland, where there are large continental ice sheets, and in the high mountains of the world in mountain glaciers. The cryosphere, the ice of the planet, is melting at an accelerating rate virtually everywhere. That's the planet's thermometer, and what is it telling us? It's telling us that the planet's getting warmer. I prefer to call it global warming because climate change is natural. We've had many natural climate changes in the past, such as during the ice ages. The Guattari period is known as the period of the ice ages, and so for about the past two million years, we've been seeing these swings uh, where we build up large ice sheets on the landscape. Separated by, by short time intervals, say about uh, 10,000 to 12,000 years, uh, called interglacial periods, uh, where it can be somewhat warm. In fact, sometimes it's been at least as warm as it is uh, currently. And we have many cores from the deep oceans that show that there's long periods of cooling followed by these fairly abrupt warming spells called interglacials. There's great evidence that we're in an interglacial period. I, obviously, as we sit here in Wisconsin today, there's no large glacier sitting right here in Milwaukee. So in Wisconsin here, certainly was glaciated many, many times. Most recently, about uh, about 21,000 years ago, we had the last big glaciers that advanced down in, here into Wisconsin. Um, during that time at the end of the Ice Age, you would have seen a scene very similar to what's in the mural behind me. It would have been tundra. Then as the climate continued to warm, boreal forest came in you know, with the, with the um, evergreens, and it continued to get warmer, and then hardwoods took over. So. Climate change is part of nature. What's concerning scientists today is at the rate at which climate change is happening. It's happening so much more quickly than it has historically. It's increasing at a rate 200 times faster. Now, now listen to this. 200 times faster than at any time in the last 800,000 years. How do we know that? By measuring and analyzing the air bubbles in ice cores that go back that far. Well, if you go back and you take a look at uh, the ice cores and the records from those, you can see that there's a direct correlation between increases in CO2 and temperature, um, as determined by something called the oxygen isotope record. We had a global cooling, by the way, for about a 20-year period back in the middle part of the 20th century that caused some people to talk about a potential ice age in our, in our uh, future. People thought maybe this was uh, uh, the climate cycle cooling once again, maybe going into one of these long glacial periods. And there was advance of smaller glaciers all over Europe and Alaska and, and all over the world. And then the Industrial Revolution hit, and a lot of those glaciers now have started to actually recede. And there's good evidence now that the Greenland ice sheet, which is one of the two large ice masses uh, left in this world, is actually thinning quite a bit. And we're losing quite a bit of mass from that. Uh, what's going to happen to that large ice sheet as climate warms? When the ice and snow in the Arctic melts, and it's melting very, very rapidly, the climate in the Arctic is changing more rapidly than anywhere else on Earth. It's, it's gone up, the average temperature has gone up between three and seven degrees Fahrenheit in just the last 50 years. But I know from the geological evidence that at times in the past, the Earth's ice has all been melted. And the sea level has been some 100 meters or 300 feet higher than it is today. Now, if all the ice on the planet continues to melt at an accelerating rate the way it is now, that's gonna raise sea level. Also, the water, as it warms up, expands, so thermal expansion contributes to that. And of course, I th about 60 to 70 percent of the world's population lives along coastlines, and so a rise in sea level means a dramatic, uh, has a dramatic impact potentially on these coastal regions. One of the predictions I've seen is that um, if you melt the West Antarctic Ice Sheet, which is a very a portion of the Antarctic Ice Sheet, you'd actually raise sea level by something like 20 feet, I've, I've been told. And that, something like that, some predictions might occur over a period of two to 300 years. And so maybe in our lifetime, we won't see significant increases in sea level, but certainly in our children's, uh, children's life. Uh, what, I, what I'm uh, interested in, uh, will it cause a tipping point to such a point where uh, it would uh, completely swamp uh, the, the, the changes that will occur. I'm hesitant to always use tipping points because they've been a sort of hot button controversial word. Uh, 
uh, in terms of the climate. I, I certainly do not believe the climate system as a whole has yet reached the tipping point. But I would say that when you talk about parts of the climate system, there may be some like sea ice that are involved in transitioning in a, a tipping point. So tipping point should not just be a, a single statement relating to the globe, but it should really be talking about a tipping point for the climate changes in a given region, like Wisconsin, in winter. And so generally speaking, my feeling is that you will see some tipping points in the impacts of climate change before the climatologists are willing to say there is a tipping point climate process going on. What the difference is now versus 100 years ago is that we really have a tougher time getting some of these seedlings to establish. That sites that are challenged now through pressures of invasive species per se, other things that compete for that same growing space on site, some of those plants are going to become more aggressive under a warming climate. People will start seeing a forest that's different from what they've known in the past. And in terms of those transitions, those transitions might see a period where the forests in general are stressed, more susceptible to insects and pests and disease. And so really what people associate with, you know, see the classic vision of tall pines in the north woods, that might not be what persists into the future. And so that our forests definitely not going to remain static as, as the climate changes. But we're kind of on the edge. That's why prairies could get into Wisconsin. We're kind of on the edge of what, what trees need and what, because um, they need a minimum amount of rainfall a year. So as patterns change, we might see more flooding or we might find drier spots, but it's not going to affect it uniformly. If we start losing ground that is forest, so that forest starts to be converted to something else, that we can lose the carbon that's locked up in that forest soil right now. And so if that gets released into the atmosphere, that can accelerate that process of warming that we've seen. Now the uncertainties in this science are in predicting exactly what's going to happen in the future. We can measure what's happened in the past, but projecting into the future, that has a certain amount of uncertainty. But it doesn't undermine in any way the basic science. There's no way we can be perfect in our science of weather and climate in um, the details of any pattern. But the overall message is very, very clear. And that's why uh, we're starting to turn a lot of attention to uh, climate adaptability. And whether these projections are true, again, needs to be looked at more carefully, at least before we start ma making major changes in our society, such as taxing greenhouse gases. So as you say, the problem is not the data, the problem is how we interpret it. We need to trust them. We need to trust that they're doing good science. And, and if the warning comes out that what's happening in the lab is happening on this planet, I don't know why people wouldn't want to take that cautious step. Maybe we are the cause of global warming, maybe we're not. Maybe the planet's going to get warmer or colder, or drier or wetter. Maybe it's not. But if it's linked to fossil fuels and the, and the pollution it produces, why wouldn't you want to err on the side of caution? Why wouldn't you want to drive less, drive smarter? Why wouldn't you want to make choices that reduce the amount of global warming gas being pumped into the atmosphere? It's only going to affect you positively in your pocketbook and positively for the Earth. And my concern, basically, relative to this is that there needs to be debate about it. There needs to be people who get together and look at the data and try to interpret it according to their own background, their own knowledge. The time for debate is done. We, we, we ought to be doing something about it. We ought to be saying, and I think we're doing that. I think you asked me before about the generation today. I think, I think, and I think it's a little bit more than just a trend. I think people are saying, oh yeah, this is a finite system. Whatever we do to it, it stays here. And this is all about responsibility to our descendants. I know it's tough. People will understand and believe when they're told that H1N1 virus is a real threat or that bird flu transmutating to human flu could be a real threat because those are immediate. Or think of the recent earthquakes with their catastrophic damage. We respond to those disasters immediately because we can see the effects. But long-term disasters, which take place over decades, we can't see that, and so it's much harder to grasp and to sink our teeth into and to address it, but we've simply got to do it. The longer we wait, the more it's going to cost in the long run. Some of the opponents say, well, a going, converting to clean energy is going to be too costly to the economy. No, it isn't. Change produces opportunity. I mean, it's looking at the glass half empty to say that. Solar power is free energy from the sun, and we've got uh, a 
lot of it. And wind energy, free energy from the wind. It turns out that America has the, so the Saudi Arabia of wind. The winds blow down through that corridor just east of the Rocky Mountains. They blow steadier and stronger than almost any other place on the planet. It's a prime place to put wind farms and get free energy from the sun. No matter how, costs, how high fuel costs rise in the future, there's no fuel costs with a solar or a wind generator. CO2 is the lifeblood, the gas that plants need in order to live. They use, of course, the carbon from CO2 in order to produce various compounds, carbohydrates and so on, in order for them to thrive. And one, let's assume it is rising, one solution would be to increase planting of trees and plants and so on that do absorb the carbon dioxide. Carbon is just, a, you know, it's in terms of what it does to absorb carbon dioxide is just another added benefit of trees, which is something that makes it really appealing. That growing a forest advances so many other benefits that even if someone is on the fence or on climate change, that's not going to prevent them from planting a tree. If someone doesn't believe in the science, if they plant a forest, they're still going to get habitat for wildlife out of the deal. And so forests are really something that's, that's uniting around that is, is there's so many benefits to it that if there's a disagreement in terms of the climate aspect to it, it's not enough to say, you know, let's not plant the trees, that forests have got that multiple benefit for everyone. There's so much that you can do, and I urge everybody to do it just the way I did in 1970. There are a lot more choices today in 2010. Do the cheap and easy stuff, pick that low-hanging fruit, get the energy-saving light bulbs, get the energy-saving thermostat, you know, put some weather stripping up, stripping up around your doors and windows, ride a bike if weather and fitness permit, take public transportation that's available near you, home gardening, home composting. Turn your thermostat down a little bit. Um, be more conserving the, of the fuel in your car. Don't uh, pretend that every red light is the beginning of a drag race. Uh, try to observe the st speed limits, because that not only saves you money, but it also burns less gas, and of course it's uh, safe, much safer too. And there's so many things that we can do in our everyday lives to reduce, uh, buy locally, groceries that are produced nearby and in, or in the city, rather than shipped all the way across the country or around the world, which costs a lot of fuel to ship them. You know, the added cost of the transportation you know, throughout the country is kind of unbelievable how far, even like milk being from Milwaukee or Wisconsin, how far that goes. The way we do it, it's probably as local as you can get. I mean, we deliver ourselves and it doesn't move around too much. I guess it's the ultimate recycling to be able to just wash, rewash the container and reuse it. Um, there's no waste that way. We get very very little breakage, you know, so, um, you know, we could go years and years with using the same bottles over and over, you know. Um, they're just rewashed and sanitized and reused again. I think we need to be concerned about ecology. We need to be concerned about our environment. But the question is, how do we go about doing that? I think we as individuals need to try to reduce the waste in our society. For example, you go to a store, you buy something, you put it in a plastic bag, you bring the plastic bag home, and it ends up in a landfill. So this is a problem I think we all need to be concerned about. Uh, whether or not this relates to global warming, of course, is another question. But we all, I think, should be good stewards of our resources. That should be stressed more. If that was stressed more, I think there would be less concern about global warming and less concern about waste, which is certainly a problem in our society today that we, I think, do need to deal with. But there's been so much disinformation disseminated among the public by those who want to keep things as they have been that the public is confused. But we've got to stop listening to the naysayers and the deniers and the contrarians. And many of these people know very little about the subject. Um, we've got to stop, we've got to start doing what needs to be done. Grow up, let's be mature and address this problem on the basis of knowledge, not on the basis of myth or inconvenience. Yeah, know that we can make a difference because we have made a difference in the past. Uh, you know, the air in L.A. from 1970 to date is not dirtier. It is cleaner, four times the cars and half the smog. Uh, you know, the Cuyahoga River outside Cleveland doesn't catch fire anymore. The ozone hole is not bigger, it's not the same size, it's smaller. And uh, we can do a lot. So now we have this, this desire to want to do something good, and we have the knowledge to do environmentally good. Those two have come together. And so I'm pretty excited. Halfway through my career, I'm starting to see that this is a generation that is saying, environmentally, there's issues, and we want to do something about it. We're tricky and, and smart and creative enough to get us in 
into situations, we can also get ourselves out of those situations. But that's our challenge. I call it the challenge of the century because it affects everything else. Water, the basic necessities of life, water supply, food supply, and in turn the economies of nations. Um, it affects political stability because when people don't have enough water or enough food or the basic necessities of life, they become restless and political stability is affected. You immediately get into people dividing into political camps and how you, they think you deal with these things, or do you have philosophical differences between people, creationists or, or, or other people, and you, you basically end up having culture wars. And I feel like not the science questions of climate change, but the discussion of those questions of climate change are one big culture war right now, and it's unfortunate. But one of the things the scientists have to contribute is that to our very best degree that we remain objective, look at the real data and things like that, continue to do research to understand how the system works. That to me is the future for hopefully helping society to resolve how it feels about climate change.